It's exciting for me to be here tonight. Uh, over a decade ago, I worked here at the University Bookstore upstairs in the marking department. And at that time, I never imagined that I would be standing here reading a book. I mean, it was one of those dreams that maybe I had in the back of my head, but I certainly didn't think about it as a reality. Also, my fascination with home started here uh, in the U District when I was getting my MLIS at the Information School across the street and worked in Suslow Library as a graduate student. So this place has a lot of memories for me. Uh, tonight I'd like to read some sections from my book in the chapter titled Crowning an Agitator. And this is the story that I happened across that uh, got me interested in home. Crowning an Agitator. With little of the syrupy shade beneath fir trees to be found on the hillside above Joe's Bay, June and July of 1911 lay long and hot upon the rooftops. Many colonists escaped into the chill of Puget Sound. Some wore underclothes. Others stripped to nature's garments, as they called it in those days. The frigid salt water didn't mind what they wore. It accepted bodies young and old, supple and frail, thin and portly, pale and swarthy, clothed and unclothed. Most folks in home didn't care whether their neighbors wore suitable covering or not. To the outside world, home is a colony of cranks, was how Jay Fox described the place in the inaugural issue of The Agitator, the anarchist newspaper he had established there in the fall of 1910. Crank is a very convenient term with which to brand those who don't follow the calf path of convention. In reality, it is a colony of very sensible people who mind their own business to a greater extent and therefore are not quite so busy as the residents of other communities in which we have lived. But even as Fox published these words, some in home did not share his views. For a time, these residents were anonymous among the 213 people living in home. But around the time the rhododendron blooms withered in the record-breaking heat of 1911, they made themselves known by paying attention to what their neighbors were doing in Joe's Bay. Most of the facts about the nude bathing cases were questioned and debated into uncertainty. It's difficult to determine exactly what happened or how many times it happened. Did Anton Zunkinelli wear breeches made of a flour sack or nothing at all? Was Stella Thorndale actually seeking a saltwater cure for her rheumatism? and just getting dressed when they caught her? Had Adrian, Adrian Wilbur's, sorry, had Adrian Wilbur's don swimming trunks or garments as unsubstantial as a dream, as Judge Graham later put it? For certain there were bathers and there were watchers. The bathers dunked themselves with a gasp and emerged with white flesh gleaming. A distance away, above the rocky shore stood the watchers sometimes concealed in the brush, and other times perched on a mound for a better view. <laughs> then, in the early summer of 1911, the watchers began to do more than just watch. They began to call on Deputy Sheriff Jim Tillman, who in turn arrested the bathers for indecent exposure. This meddling in affairs infuriated Jay Fox. He was not inclined to quietly suffer fools in their injustices, petty or otherwise. By the time he moved to home in 1910, he was well known among anarchists in Chicago. Forty years old, with a head of prematurely gray hair, Fox had a narrow chin, high cheekbones, and a brow that often furrowed and concealed his eyes in shadow. Jay had more fiber and calmness and strength than the rank-and-file anarchists, wrote journalist Hutchins Hapgood. He talks well and reasons, not emotionally, but coolly. And in character, he is balanced, tolerant, and kind. 
He is a learned man among them, schoolmasterly in his look, and talks in a slow, deliberate way. Fox came to home hoping that it would be an inexpensive place to live and publish an anarchist newspaper. Home had been without a newspaper since the demonstrator ceased publication in 1907, and the agitator consciously filled this gap. Compared to previous newspapers published in home, however, the agitator, the agitator rarely reported on colony affairs, at least at first. Coming out every other week, it sought a national readership and contained articles about the industrial workers of the world and other labor unions, published political tracts of Fox's friends and associates, and summarized developments in the labor and anarchist movements in a front page column called The Passing Show. The agitator aims to be a live issue and it's going to stir things up, declared the first issue. Its first attempt will be that of arousing comrades and friends of freedom. There is no use dallying any longer in the philosophical mazes of contemplation. We must dig and do. This sentiment was largely devoted to the outside world, but with his neighbors getting arrested, Fox felt compelled to stir things up in home. His response to the situation was an opinion piece titled, The Nude and the Prudes, <laughs> published in the July 1st, 1911 issue of The Agitator. Clothes are made to protect the body, not hide it, he declared in the opening sentence. The mind that associates impurity with the human body is itself impure. And he continued in this vein, attacking those in the community that would enforce their values upon their neighbors. And I quote pretty extensively from that article. And if you'd like to read it, you can read the book. Uh, <laughs> In short, he criticizes the prudes for not minding their own business and draws stark lines in the battle ahead. He says, in essence, there's no middle ground, no room for compromise in the battle between what would become the nudes and the prudes. This gives a taste of the fascinating story I happened across while sitting at a microfilm viewing station in Suzalo Library. Under the supervision of librarians Glenda Pearson and Jessica Albano, I was involved in a project to catalog small community newspapers published throughout the Pacific Northwest. My job was to assign genre terms that identified the audience of the newspapers. And then I happened across the agitator the agitator agitated me. I had trouble cataloging it, to say the least. There was no term for radical newspapers. And I did some research into it and discovered a remarkable story of not just the newspaper, but the town of home itself. First, I'd like to give you a little background on home by way of answering one of the most common questions I get. Who's the guy on the cover? It's not me. I wish, it, I wish I had a suit like this. I would do my readings in it. Uh, this is Oliver Verity, one of the founders of Home. And uh, the reason I cho it is, chose it is because of the ambiguity of the photo. I'm not really sure what he's doing. Is he sizing up the tree, welcoming all to home? Doesn't matter, it, it's just a great photo. In 1895, he, along with two other men, George Allen and B.F. Odell, left from Tacoma and ventured by boat into South Puget Sound, looking for a site for their colony. They wanted to found a community that valued individual freedom above all else. Land would be held in common, but each family would receive a two-acre parcel to cultivate and improve as they pleased all communal effort would be voluntary. In many ways, they were reacting to the failure that they had experienced at Glenis, a socialist utopian experiment that they had participated in. And it's important to note that they did not recognize their arrangement as anarchist until someone from the outside pointed it out to them. It was a little, it was significant 
and a little dangerous uh, to identify yourself as an anarchist in the Gilded Age because the culture at large saw anarchists as terrorists. Throughout much of the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, there were a series of bombings and assassinations carried out by people who identified themselves as anarchists. President McKinley, for example, uh, was killed by a man who claimed to be an anarchist in 1901. In fact, this event triggered intense hostility toward home. Even though the colonists were nonviolent and had no connection to the assassination, and I dedicate an entire chapter to that episode, and in a lot of ways it represents the first free speech uh, fight that they're involved in and, in, and and also put home on the map, at least in the region. They named the town home because they were weary of moving. And it was a remarkable place. During its time as an anarchist experiment, they've published five different newspapers with great titles like Discontent, The Mother of Progress, and Clothed with the Sun. The community itself was exceptionally tolerant. One of the core principles they believed in was that members, and this is a quote from one of the early founders, Oliver Verity, on the cover, uh, they believe that the members ha should have the personal liberty to follow their own line of action, no matter how much it may differ from the custom of the past. This was pretty unusual in you know, it's some Gilded Age, Victorian era. In practice, this meant that they welcomed many unconventional people, including a man uh, uh, who now would be called a cross-dresser. He gave a lecture at Liberty Hall in a dress, telling people, sort of telling them the, about the sanitary virtues of female garb. That was the language that they used at the time. He found that it wasn't so good for carpentry work, and they actually teased him about that the next day and when he asked for overalls. As a, but they were good-natured about it. They weren't, you know, I mean, they did, they, they let, every, let him speak his piece. So as a result of this tolerance, a, a really a variety of political philosophies could be found in home, not just anarchists. So there were socialists and others. And this is what Jay Fox was defending, this sense of absolute individual freedom. And he did it with such passion because he was a veteran labor activist and had lived through events like the Haymarket Affair. And so he saw conflicts with power through this lens of a fight for freedom. And essentially, he was a, a, a guy who was used to fights in the city coming to a small town and using tactics that may have worked in the big city against his neighbors. Uh, so I think uh, I'm going to show the, uh, I'm going to read a passage that illustrates the effect of his article on the community and then outside the community. Within Home, the Nude and the Prudes article blasted the already fragile community into factions, the Nudes and the Prudes. In doing so, it contributed to the cycle of reprisal that had started earlier that summer. The Nudes bathed in even greater numbers, and the Prudes continued to summon Sheriff Tillman, but now a principal the very liberty at the heart of the colony was at stake. The first nude bathing trial in late July 1911 revealed just how high tempers were running. A schoolhouse in nearby Long Branch, this is on the Key Peninsula by the way, served as a makeshift courtroom. Deputy Prosecutor Grover C. Nolte, an attorney in his early 20s, arrived around noon on the steamer from Tacoma, and the proceedings began at 1.30 on a sultry afternoon. I saw Mrs. Thorndale in the water with a little girl, Edgar Hicklin, a prude, testified. Neither she nor the girl had any clothes on. He said that he had observed the incident while he and Theodore Meyer, son of the home storekeeper, were strolling down a country road on the morning of July 14th. Roger Meekins, the attorney from Seattle representing the nudes, suggested that perhaps the two men had gone down that country road for the purpose of being shocked. 
Hicklin's answer went unrecorded, but he likely denied such an insinuation. Persons possessed of enormous virtue who do not like the community better get out of it, Meekins railed, and the nudes burst into applause. On the stand, Stella Thorndale, Stella Thorndale explained that her doctor had ordered saltwater baths for her rheumatism. And being lame, she had asked for help getting dressed after her bath. Even though several women of home, Anna Marquis, Bessie Levine, Gertie Vos, and Sarah Voglanoff substantiated her claim, Thorndale was fined $65. It should have been 100, a prude shouted. This comment so enraged Frank Peace, a former soldier who lived in home, that he slugged the man. <laughs> the two exchanged blows with Peace appearing to have the advantage until Deputy Prosecutor Nolte threw himself between the two men. People of home shook their fists at the lawyer saying they'd never gotten a square deal in the courts and never expected it. Anna Falkoff and Stella Rosnick were also fined. However, Ethel Ostroff's case was thrown out because witnesses couldn't agree whether she was bathing in the nude, at a picnic, or ill in bed. <laughs> the trial dragged on for 11 hours throughout the afternoon and into the night. Gloom crept unnoticed into the schoolhouse as nudes, prudes, legal arbiters, and curious bystanders waited for decisions that would only be appealed. Outside of home, the authorities took notice of the nude and the prudes as well. In one evening in August, a deputy sheriff arrived from Tacoma to arrest Jay Fox. Found at an evening gathering, the editor willingly gave himself up and quietly followed the officer down to the launch, tied at the wharf. Fox had suspected the authorities might come for him having read of their intentions in a Tacoma newspaper. Besides, he expected that sooner or later, his writing might land him in jail. Every radical editor is subject to such persecutions, for the powers that be are sensitive to criticism and will endeavor on every opportunity to throttle the voice of truth, he wrote. For several weeks, Deputy Prosecutor Nolte Notice this name, he's appearing, he's, he was the attorney in the, in the nude bathing cases, he's also the guy going after Jay Fox. For several weeks, Deputy Prosecutor Nolte had been pushing for the arrest of Jay Fox under the Washington state law that made it a misdemeanor to publish, distribute, or circulate any printed matter which, uh, this is a quote, shall tend to encourage or advocate disrespect of the law or for any court or courts of justice. The Washington State Legislature passed a version of this statute with anarchists in mind soon after President McKinley's assassination. It lay like an unused crosscut saw for almost a decade, gathering rust, but with many sharp teeth, until Nolte proposed applying it to Jay Fox. Some of his colleagues doubted the statute's legal efficacy However, and according to one Tacoma newspaper, Nolte waited for two weeks as city officials withheld the filing until more authorities or laws could be looked up. But then someone from home, perhaps a disgruntled prude, tipped off the prosecuting attorney that, the fo that Fox might abscond. Thus, at, after getting a hastily written warrant, the deputy sheriff rented a launch and arrived and, and arrested Fox in the middle of the night. The massive stone edifice of the Pierce County Courthouse once dominated the hill above Tacoma. It was built in the eclectic ornate style of, late, of the late 19th century. But just like its medieval forebears, the stone facade of this Romanesque revival courthouse exuded permanence weight, power, and rigidity. Even the things that seemed light about the building, the arched windows, the sloped and plentiful gables, the conical roofs topped with spires, the 222 foot clock tower, accentuated the heaviness of the rusticated walls. <clears throat> 
Somewhere in the basement of this building, Jay Fox was locked up the day after his arrest. Bail had been set for $1,000, but Fox's friends were only able to find Washington State Senator Peter Jensen to stand as a surety. Judge William O. Chapman wanted at least one other person. According to the newspapers, Fox's face displayed not a tremor of emotion when he heard that he would remain in jail. As Fox waded through the night in the hardened steel tank reserved for desperate criminals, they, were, they made an, a point of emphasizing that in the newspaper. That's where he was spent his night. The hardened steel tank reserved for desperate criminals. He must have re remembered the other times he'd been jailed. After McKinley's assassination, he had been among many radicals across the country who were detained and then released when no connection was found between them and the assassin. He must have remembered, too, the Haymarket martyrs who had been arrested, tried, and executed for what they, they said and believed a quarter century before. The first issue of The Agitator had been dedicated to their memories. And I, there's a picture of it in the book. Uh, and just to talk a little bit, I, I introduced the Haymarket events earlier in the book, and I'll just sort of take a little break to talk about what that is and why it's significant. This is an event uh, that really shaped the perspective of radicals of, of Jay Fox's generation. Um, and it was involved, it involved a bombing uh, that led to the arrest of several prominent anarchist leaders who didn't have any connection to that actual crime. And they were ultimately executed, uh, four of them were. And they were called the Haymarket Martyrs. The first issue of The Agitator had been dedicated to the memories of the Haymarket Martyrs. The front page was emblazoned with an etching of the monument that marks the grave, their grave, in the Waldheim Cemetery in Chicago. A woman, grass, a woman wrapped in a cloak stands above a fallen man, her hand reaching toward his bearded face, her right hand angling across her body in a gesture that is bold and protective. On the pedestal are the last words of August Spies, spoken as he stood beside his comrades on the gallows, a white gown draped over his clothes, a cloth sack over his head, a noose around his neck. There will come a time when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. J. Fox matured in this silence. The agitator was an agent of this silence. As he waded through the night, confined by rock and stone and steel, Fox listened hard to this silence. Another question I often get is what drew you to home? As a graduate student, I, how could I ignore such a fascinating story? I must admit that it was much more interesting than learning cataloging rules. But the research I did as a graduate student was like a seed that needed a few years to germinate. I didn't consider writing about home in this way until I got a job as a librarian at UW Tacoma Library and moved to Tacoma with my wife. After living there a year or two, I realized how nearby home was to Tacoma. And actually, the history of home is very tied up in the history of Tacoma. It's just 20 miles as the crow flies or 40 minutes by car to get there, you go over the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, turn at Purdy, and go on to the Key Peninsula. There's a town there still called home. I encourage you to visit. It's a pretty cool place. I started writing creative nonfiction. And I wondered whether anyone had written a book about home. And except for a few chapters in history books, no one had. Most of the book uh, was written while I was getting my MFA in creative writing at Pacific Lutheran University. And I received a lot of valuable guidance through the process. Uh, and it really it was my, my thesis. The first draft of it was really my thesis. But it's also important to note uh, that while the materials in the UW libraries inspired the project, they also 
largely sustained the project. I don't know how many books, uh, reels of microfilm, images, newspapers, and other documents I dug up. And the fact that I worked there as a librarian and had the support of my colleagues and supervisors also made it possible. Yet deeper reasons motivated me as well. Writing this book about home is one of the ways that I put down a taproot. It was only after I was well into the book that I recognized that the name of this place was part of its allure. As I was growing up, my family moved around just enough that I became sensitive to how place shapes my own identity. To make a long story short, I, like the folks in home, were weary of moving. And I found myself in Tacoma uh, with the desire to make this place, that place my home. And while I wrote the book, my wife and I bought a house, my two sons were born, and over the past nine years, uh, we've deepened our connection to the community in Tacoma and the larger region. And this is one of the reasons why I chose to write certain passages of the book in the first person. It kind of jumps around. Most of the book is written in the third person, and focusing on the story of home, but I also shift occasionally to talk about my own discovery of certain aspects of it. And before I read this last section, and then we'll have a little Q&A afterward, I'd like to comment on what makes this uh, more than just a quirky, tragicomic story about you know this anarchist colony. So Jay Fox, and I'm kind of giving away the ending. Uh, you know he he was arrested. Uh, he 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 was found guilty and uh, um, of of uh, publishing matter that encouraged disrespect for the law. He ultimately appealed that decision to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in 1915, the decision was upheld by Oliver Wendell Holmes. If anyone is familiar with the history of free speech, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes is a, real, a pivotal figure. And he's the Supreme Court justice who only a decade later would write landmark free speech cases. So there's really only like 10 years or so between Jay Fox's case and Oliver Wendell Holmes' later cases. And it's like if it happened 10 years later, it would have turned out differently. Here's one of Holmes's famous sentences. If there is any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought. Not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for thought we hate. And this is really the modern idea of free speech that's used today. And as I show, Jay Fox, as I show in the chapter, Jay Fox was among those who was advocating for a similar approach to free speech in the era before Holmes's thinking changed. Whether it had an influence or not, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say. And yet, at the same time that Fox was defending this freedom, his approach contributed to the factionalism that ultimately tore apart the experiment at home. And for me as a writer, that's what's really interesting, that there was this community that really at its heart was in conflict with itself. So I'm just gonna read this last passage, which is one of those first person passages where I go to that Pierce County Courthouse building I described uh, in, in detail and get to hear about what it's like today. <clears throat> On the 100th anniversary of the verdict in Jay Fox's case, I visit the site of the Pierce County Courthouse and find in the back corner of a parking lot above moss-covered asphalt an obscure plaque commemorating the building. The county courthouse was the original occupant of this lot. The stone wall is all that remains of the historic structure, reads a marker affixed to the very wall it describes. Looking like the last remnant of a dungeon, the rough sandstone blocks, darkened with spots of lichen, run the length of the lot. Boarded over passageways lead below, below the imposing brick structure of the National Guard Armory just up the hill. The courthouse was demolished in 1959. It was considered a fire hazard. <laughs> <laughs>
When the wrecking ball smashed through the walls, it exposed sunlight upon the jury room where the ten men and two women deliberated over the fate of Jay Fox. They sat somewhere 30, or 30 feet or so above my head. They had not reached a decision by 10 o'clock on the night the trial ended, and they continued into the next day. Next day. Did some take Judge Chapman's words to heart and puzzle over the principles of free speech? Did others simply want to damn the anarchists to the clink? They took so long that people outside began to whisper that the trial might end with a hung jury. But they finally emerged at 5 o'clock on January 12, 1912. Guilty of the crime of editing printed matter tending to encourage and advocate disrespect for the law as charged in the information, spoke forewoman Lida Kinnewell, the wife of a wheelwright at Griffin Wheel Company. As you can tell, I love these old names and the weird things that people did for jobs back in the olden days. Um, perhaps indicating that this decision was not reached with the same certitude as a steel wheel rolling upon its rail, she added, we, the jury, ask leniency of the court. Excused by the judge, they filed quickly out of the courtroom. Colonel Anderson rushed forward. This was uh, Jay Fox's lawyer. Rushed forward, seeking an explanation from the jury. There's your verdict. That's all we have to say, one of them said. Today, a century later, two National Guardsmen in the alley behind the armory are loading machine guns into the back of a white delivery truck, chatting nonchalantly and handling the weapons as if they are cordwood. An attorney in a dark suit parks his car without glancing up and briskly walks to his appointment in the huge block of concrete, glass, and steel that replaced the old courthouse. The weather is cool and clear, fogging my breath and chilling my hands. And as I leave the lot, I see the attendant ensconced warmly in his booth, that the attendant ensconced warmly in his booth only wears shirt sleeves. I notice too, for the first time, that just beyond the beige building of CJ Bail Bonds, Mount Rainier is visible. At least once, J. Fox, upon emerging from the courtroom and descending its front steps, could have squinted upon the bright immensity of the mountain. The white dome, the first sight of the outside world, would have ached in his eyes. So we have a, a little time for questions, and I'd be happy to answer them. Hi, Carolyn. So um, I've read a lot of history books, and I've le read a lot of memoirs, but I've never read a book like yours that mixes memoir with, or, or um, a little bit of memoir, <laughs> with, with history. And um, I, I was just fascinated by that juxtaposition. Thank and, you. Um, I'd be interested if you could talk a little bit about how, how that concept of constructing a, a, a book came, mm -hmm. came together. Yeah. Well, I set out to write a particular kind of book. I was really inspired by books like uh, Hampton Sides, Blood and Thunder, which is this excellent history of uh, Kit Carson and the con conquest of the Southwest. And it's all written in the third person, as a lot of uh, I don't like this as a genre term, but popular histories are written that way. Um, and I, that's what I wanted to write, and that's how I started to write it. And then as I started going into it, I found that there were certain things that I could not say when I was writing in the third person. So uh, I switched into the, the first person, and it allowed me to uh, talk about myself as a storyteller and in some ways reflect on the effect of researching and telling the story on my own life. And then, you know, if I had kept it in the third person, that parallel between writing about home and establishing my home in Tacoma 
what if something that like maybe would have gotten a sentence in the acknowledgments? Uh, and I felt like it was an important part of the book. Um, and uh, I, but I but again I I really tried to focus the story on home itself. And as I as I tried to decide about what what parts of my own story do I want to include, I really tried to emphasize those parts where my own life was intersecting with home. So I didn't bring in, you know, as I was writing the book, I, there were political things going on, for instance, uh, that I would see these parallels in the news. I didn't bring that in because I felt like that was outside of the story. Yeah. Is there much of a, a people, are people trying to get some sort of more of a like, memorial there? Um, that means just a plaque? The, you've seen the plaque in home? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that the people who live in home, my sense is that they see the history of home as fitting in the larger history of the Key Peninsula, and the people who are carrying the torch of, of remembering the history of home are based with the Key Peninsula Historical Society. So uh, I did a reading in home uh, this summer that was sponsored by the Key Peninsula Historical Society. And there were a lot of people who showed up from the community. Uh, and in particular, there, there are people who are descendants of the, the members of home. And it'll be interesting to see what they do with this history. But I don't know of anything to uh, make more of a, you know, it's like a mo bigger memorial than that, that plaque. Started as mm -hmm. an anarchist movement, but then it seems to me confusing that there was, you know, so fractured between the prudes and the nudes. <laughs> yeah. How did that develop? That's a good question. And I, I'm actually giving a talk at the Historical uh, Society Museum next Thursday. I'm going to go into a little more detail about, okay, well, why was there a deputy sheriff in an anarchist colony? That seems <laughs> a little uh, odd and ironic. The, the big change uh, for them was that they, so I talked about how originally uh, everybody held the land in common. And so to become a member of home, what you would do is you would pay for the cost of the land and that would go to the Mutual Home Association. And then uh, any improvements you made to the land you owned, but the association held the land. In 1908, they changed that so that the members owned the land outright and then they changed the, the bylaws again, saying that if you sold the land, that the person who bought the land wouldn't become a member. So that meant that people started moving into home who were not, uh, may not sh have shared the values of the original founders. Again, then that raises the question, well, why did they change it? I could, you know, this was a time where the newspaper wasn't published in home. I, you know there weren't records that I could check about. It said that one story that I that I heard was that there was a lot of conflict about this, but that they ultimately decided to like there was enough of a a group of people who wanted to make this change, and then they were like, well, everybody's doing it, so we're just going to all do this. So the one thing that held the community together and kept it from being just a group of individuals was gone. And then when they had this conflict emerge, there wasn't really any way to keep that cohesion. Is it? Yeah. So utopian communities, you know, we see them during this period and earlier all mm -hmm. over the country. And they're always considered a little bit radical, but anarchist, I mean, like how many utopian communities were actually declared themselves an anarchists? There was one other one in New Jersey that came a little bit after uh, home, and I'm because it's Friday night, and I'm kind of tired. I'm blanking on the name, but I I, t I talked to a, a fellow who's um, getting a, his PhD in political science and is interested in anarchism, and he's working with that group. It'll it'll come to me. Um, the name that's coming right now is not is not what it is, but yeah, there there was one. In, does anybody here know what that was called? It was the, it's was in New Jersey, and then that uh, they became very focused on education rather than a specific colony. 
So. Wasn't there one on Whidbey Island too? Well, I think there were a number of socialist uh, utopias. All the other uh, utopias in this region were socialist. Mm -hmm. And this was the only anarchist utopia and they chose it because they had tried to out socialism and they felt like there were too many rules and some people did all the work and other people didn't do any of the work. So we we're like, we're not gonna have any rules and if we're gonna do any work, then it's gonna be voluntary. Well, thank you everyone for coming out tonight.